We're going to continue in Genesis today, so if you have a Bible, open it to Genesis chapter 25. To, there's 50 chapters, so today marks the halfway point of the book of Genesis. <clears throat> we'll spend most of the rest of the year finishing the book of Genesis. And um, we're continuing right where we left off last week and focusing on Isaac. We've kind of divided the book into six parts, six patriarchs, if you will. Um, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And so we're in the Isaac section. And what you're going to see about Isaac, this is our second week looking at Isaac's story, is he really kind of, he's kind of a transition character. There's not, um, he, doesn't, he doesn't take the spotlight a lot. A lot of the chapters concerning Isaac really focus on other people in his life, like his wife last week and his, his sons in chapter 25. And so we're going to see kind of Isaac is really just a, a, a transition character. But, but God does a lot through Isaac and, and through his obedience and his faithfulness. Um, and even through his failure as well. And, and so what I love about Genesis is we see, we've named it saints and villains because we see the good attributes of the, the faith of these patriarchs and people in Genesis, but we also see their villainous ways too. We see their depravity and we see that, that all people are, are unholy, that all people are unable to save themselves and all people need grace. And so we'll look at that today. Um, really the main theme of chapter 25 is, is that the death of Abraham, and as he dies, then passing the torch on to Isaac, and then where the inheritance will go from Abraham to Isaac, and then will it go, he says he has two sons, will it go to Esau, or will it go to Jacob? And so there's a sibling rivalry that comes out, and, you know, being a part of uh, pastoral ministry for a while, you know, I've been around a lot of families who have lost loved ones and and, uh, went, walked through the painful experience of a funeral, and all too often that, that process becomes a painful experience because there's bickering and arguing over, over who gets what um, of the deceased, like where their estate goes, how it's divided up, you know, who gets how much money and what land and what house and all that stuff. My personal goal um, is just to spend all my money and be broke my whole life so that when I die, my kids won't have anything to fight over. I got five of them, so it's, like, it's a lot. So if I just spend it all and have nothing when I die, I just feel like they'd be better, better humans that way. So that's my personal goal. I don't know about y'all. But, um, but when we look at this, it's, it's no different in ancient times. Uh, there was a lot of bickering over inheritances and, and what that looked like when one person died and left to their kids. And, and the ancient customary preference went to the firstborn. The firstborn son got everything, um, which we look at and we're like, well, that's not fair, but that's just the way it was. And, um, and so the firstborn son of Abraham would have been Ishmael, not Isaac. But we're going to see that Isaac is the one who receives the inheritance and then deal with who Isaac's inheritance goes to once he dies, okay? So I got three points I want you to see. We'll look at inheritance as a principle, um, both physically and spiritually. Secondly, we'll look at that rivalry uh, between brothers, uh, sibling rivalry, and how sin gets in the way of what God's called us to. And thirdly, we'll look at the doctrine of election and how God chooses or why God chooses uh, to bless some and not all. And in the first point, we'll look at the inheritance. And in chapter 25, we come to the end of Abraham's life. And so uh, for, for the point of inheritance, let's look at chapter 25, verses 7 through 8. For the, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read every verse in the chapter, uh, but I want to I get you the context as best I can. And in verse 7, it says, These are the days of the years of Abraham's life, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. So we see very clearly in the book of Genesis God's blessing upon Abraham. He calls Abraham out of Ur, of Chaldea, uh, to a land that he had never been to, calls him to walk away from everything he had known. Uh, We know from other parts of Scripture that Abraham was worshiping false gods. God calls him out of that polytheism to be monotheistic, to worship one God um, in spirit and in truth. And God makes a promise, a covenant with Abraham. He says, I will give you this land to your descendants, and I will bless you with many offspring. And he changes his name from Abram, father of a nation, to Abraham, which means father of many nations. We see that's fulfilled spiritually in Christ as Christ adopts people from all nations, tribes, and tongues. And we're called children of Abraham because we are people of faith. It doesn't matter what ethnicity we are. It matters who we believe and trust in. And so God does all this and he begins all of this work through this man, Abraham, and he blesses him greatly. God brings him to the land, miraculously gives him a family, founds the covenant, and Abraham actually ends up with a large family. Um, He only has one son that 
that God ordained through his wife, Sarah. You remember that hiccup with Hagar. Sarah was unable to get pregnant, and so she said, hey, why don't you marry my servant, Hagar? They do that, and they have a son, Ishmael. Um, But God makes it clear that that was not a part of his plan. God condemns that act. Then uh, with Sarah, he has the son Isaac. Then after Sarah's death, there's nothing necessarily sinful about this, but he marries again. Uh, Verse 1 says, Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. And he marries this woman, Keturah, and they have other children. And so then the question is, where is God's promise going to lie? Uh, With what son is the inheritance going to be given to? Now, even though he had married these women, one was polygamy that was condemned by God, but even though he had married these women, uh, Moses calls these women mere concubines, indicating that God's promise did not rest upon the children with these women. In verse 6, it says, but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts. And while he was still living, he sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the east country. And so he's, he's, not, he's not neglectful. of He's not a bad father. He's not neglectful to those kids. But it's very evident that that was not God's plan. And the inheritance was to go to Isaac. So he gives them gifts. We don't know what it is. Probably Amazon gift cards. And he sends them eastward. Now, this indicates that, that Abraham is acknowledging and trying to follow after the plan that God had set in place. And, and so in Genesis 25, 5, it says Abraham gave all he had to Isaac. Isaac is the recipient of the inheritance. Now, um, in my family, I have two sisters, two older sisters, and my family, my sisters will tell you that I'm the favorite child. Um, Jamie, you know this, and, um, and my mom would validate this as well, and, and so that's just the way it is. And, and when, when my parents pass away, if they were to leave everything to me, even though I'm the favorite child, uh, my sisters would say, that's not fair. Right, and they would they would probably y'all would probably hear their argument and think it's a good argument, but I would make the case it's mom and dad's stuff, and they can do with it whatever they want. Right, so mom and dad, if y'all want to give me everything um, when you go to be with Jesus, that's your prerogative. Okay, and and to some extent, my argument would be right uh, because whoever owns the thing is in charge of the thing, and and what we lose sometimes when we look at passages of scripture that seem unfair, when we deal with God's election and blessing and things like that, sometimes we're quick to say, well, that's not fair because we want God chopping up the pie in equal portions to every human being ever, and it's easy for us to look at God and say that God's not just or God's not fair. But we forget that God owns everything, right? God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. That means everything is God's. Even the stuff that's in your name, the deed has your name on it. The the bank account has your name on it. All of those things ultimately belong to God. You're simply a steward of God's things, God's wealth. And so you are called upon to, to live with that in a way that's pleasing to God. So when we talk about inheritance, what we see is that God is in charge of even the physical inheritance of someone like Isaac. And and so um, Abraham honors God by obeying God's will and giving all that he has to Isaac. Now, Jesus told, uh, told the Pharisees that they were children of Satan, right? Um, maybe some of you guys in a a fit of rage have exclaimed that to your children. Um, you felt like they were that, but But the Bible uses familial language all the time. So Jesus is using familial language when he looks at the Pharisees and he says, you're sons of your father, the devil. Now what he's indicating is that they have no inheritance because they're not sons of God the Father. And so when we look at physical inheritance, it's supposed to lift our eyes to the spiritual inheritance that we have in our heavenly Father. That because we who have trusted in Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, his resurrection, have become adopted sons and daughters of a heavenly Father, then we have an eternal inheritance. And and we're to remember that because the Bible uses that familial language to describe us. We are sons and daughters in his kingdom. We are given eternal inheritance. We are called brothers and sisters of one another to care for one another. This joy of this eternal inheritance is what Peter exclaimed in his epistle. In 1 Peter 1, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen what, how Peter describes it. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiling, and undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. 
Now, notice who caused us to be born again in that passage. God. Let, let me put it to you this way. You have absolutely zero creative input on where you were born, the family you were born into, the time you were born, right? You have no control over that. You just, you just acknowledge at some point, you, you spawn and you're, you are aware, this is my family, right? Some of you guys think, well, maybe it would have been nice to be born to an Elon Musk or a Jeffrey Bezos, right? And have that bigger inheritance, but, but God knows best. And so God was sovereign over the placing of you, even who you were born to, where you were born, how you were born, all those things. And it's the same way. And it's a fitting analogy for our spiritual life because God causes us to be born again. Jesus tells us we cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven unless we are born again. And here in Peter, he says that God causes that to happen. And in, in John chapter 1, it says that we are born not of the will of man, but of the will of God. And, and so it's important to understand that the circumstances of even how we came to be in this spiritual family is not predicated on our action. It's all predicated upon God's grace. And so, so as Christians, we don't, we don't spend our time puffing out our chest saying we're holier than everybody else and we're better and we're smart. And so because we made a really smart decision once at church camp or walked an aisle during a revival and said a sinner's prayer, then we're smarter than everybody that's going to hell. No, we say, why in the world would God have adopted us into his heavenly family? But he has. And so we spend our days not boasting in ourselves, but praising God because he is worthy of our worship. All of life is meant for us to lift our eyes from the temporal inheritance and comfort of this life to the eternal inheritance and comfort of heaven, of eternity. And every story in the Bible is really the same story. It's a story of God's redemption and grace and how sin gets in the way of that. And so that's what we have to look forward to as sons and daughters with an inheritance, but sin gets in the way. So let's see that play out in the second point, which is rivalry. Um, show of hands, how many of you are, are, grew up as an only child? Okay, handful of you. All right, you guys are like the messed up people, okay? You're insufficient in life. I'm telling you this because I love you, okay? You're insufficient in life because you didn't have anybody to fist fight with growing up, okay? It's, it's made you incompetent as an adult, okay? Um, some of you guys, I'm, I'm kidding, I just wanted to pick on y'all, but, but some of you find that in other places. You find a cousin to, to fight with all the time, but that trial by fire with siblings is sometimes really good for us, but um, for some of you guys, uh, maybe you only children don't, don't have the high therapy bills that the rest of us have dealing with our trauma, okay? Um, but here we're going to see a lot of sibling rivalry begin with Esau and Jacob, and this is going to continue all the way up past chapter 36. So this is going to be a dominant theme as we continue through the book of Genesis. Jacob and Esau are going to rival one another and be against one another and, and, and really have a hard time together. And so we'll see that play out, and the effects of sin are strong with these two sons of Isaac. Let's, let's read verses 19 through 21. It says, These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son, Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Now, this is just a quick sentence describing the fact that they had trouble uh, getting pregnant. And it's easy for us to kind of gloss over that and just fly by it, but it's really important to understand what God is doing here with Rebecca's barrenness. It's similar to Sarah's inability to conceive and have children initially. I want you to remember what God's promise to Abraham was when he called him out of the land to the new land. It was descendants. It was offspring. The whole promise was predicated on them having children. Matter of fact, many children. And, and Sarah's unable to get pregnant. Rebecca's unable to get pregnant. Even though Rebecca's family had prayed a blessing on her in chapter 24, verse 60, if you look a page back in your Bible, they prayed, may you become thousands of 10,000s. And here verse 21 shows that her inability to conceive is a real problem. It's a real problem for the kingdom and family of God. But verse 21 shows us the real resolution to that problem. Right? It wasn't taking matters into their own hands like Isaac's dad had done. Isaac, thankfully, doesn't do what Abraham did and just find another woman to get pregnant. But instead, he goes to, pr to prayer. He goes to the Lord on behalf of his wife. 
Verse 21 says that he prays for his wife and she is able to then conceive. You see, we tend to do the same thing. Really, really more like Abraham than Isaac. We tend to view prayer as an invalid solution to the problems of our life. It, it tends to be for us a last resort. When we get to a point of desperation and none of the other things have worked, then we'll finally get desperate enough to hit our face and pray for something. I want you to ask yourself this morning, what, what is the most pressing thing in your life that you're praying for right now? Maybe some of y'all need to be like, am I even praying at all? Are you praying? Period. But those of you who do faithfully pray, what, is, what, are, what are one or two of the things that you're really praying for right now? And I want you to ask these follow-up questions to yourself. Are the things that you're praying for in God's timing and for God's glory? You see, the difficulty of conception for Rebecca lasted 20 years. And, it, and when God had promised descendants, it's, it would have been easy for them to say, well, why is he not delivering on his promise? He promised this. Why would he not give us this when we ask for it? It wasn't in his time, and it needed to be for his glory. So sometimes I think if we're honest, the things that we're praying for, we could ask God, is this in your time? And if we're honest, maybe we know the answer, that it's not in God's timing for us to have that thing that we're asking him for. Or maybe if we're really transparent and honest with ourselves, that the thing that we want is really going to seek to glorify us and make us comfortable rather than bring glory to the Father. You see... So many women in the Messianic lineage were barren. You have Sarah, you have Rebecca. Looking forward that we, in the part that we haven't preached yet, Jacob's wives, Leah and Rachel, both at some point in their life have difficulty becoming pregnant. So the wives of, of the three men that are repeated with the name of God, in the Bible you hear over and over, we worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All three of them had, had difficulty getting pregnant and bringing about the plan of God. They, the, the point, why would God allow that? The point of All of this is so that God shares his glory with no one. The family of God was not predicated on them doing something. It was God doing something among them. God grants the answer to prayer. He can be glorified most. You see, the the answer to prayer came in a timely way that was on God's timeline, not their own. And he prays, and God answers their prayer in verses 24 through 26. It says, when her days to give birth were completed. Behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So Jacob and Esau would have a, a long rivalry against one another. It began in the womb. They, I mean, they're just typical brothers. They're fighting even before they come out of the womb, okay? Esau, he, he was called Esau because he was hairy. His name means hairy in Hebrew. In the language they spoke, they literally just named their kid Harry. Now, not like, not like Harry Styles, like H-A-I-R-Y. They're just like, that's the hairy kid. And um, so even like from day one, this guy, it's not going well for him. And then Jacob comes out of the womb uh, holding his brother's heel, and they name him Jacob, which in Hebrew means usurper. It it, it really has the connotation of of him always clawing, grabbing, striving to get ahead. And that that would be really the story of Jacob's life, that he would do anything. Uh, sinful things to get ahead in life, to get ahead of his brother, to get ahead of everyone else around him. Um, And so their names are are deeply impactful and prophetic of the life that they live. Um, In verse 27, it tells us about who they are when they grow up a little bit. Verse 27 says, when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And so Esau's, uh, he, he's out doing like Bear Grylls stuff, you know, just surviving, killing stuff and making skins and deer jerky and whatever. And Isaac loves that. And Jacob's kind of a mama's boy and he's hanging out inside all the time. And um, it, it, he's probably weak and, and unable to, to be as handy and do as many things as his brother. But what we see very clearly in Esau is he's very strong He's kind of a mountain man, and he's very self-sufficient. And this is going to cause him to become very prideful as he continues on in his life, and we'll see in the rest of the book. And, and what I love about the example that we see in Jacob and Esau is it gives messed up sinners like me hope. 
Because God very rarely works through the strongest, most powerful people. Because God will share his glory with no one. If you want to do great things for God and share the glory with him, you won't do great things for God. And, and God has a, a pattern that we can see in Scripture of choosing the weak things to bring glory to his own name. I mean, even from the very beginning, Cain and Abel, as they're born, Cain was the oldest, Cain was the firstborn, Cain was the, should have been the recipient of inheritance, all of those things, yet God accepted worship from Abel, not Cain. The younger brother that was born, Seth, would be the chosen line for the messianic lineage. The younger Isaac is chosen instead of the elder Ishmael. The youngest son of Jacob, Joseph, will become the prince of Egypt who will deliver his people, not the oldest son. The younger brother, Judah, will be in the line of the Messiah rather than one of his older brothers. The youngest and scrawniest shepherd named David will be chosen to be a giant slaying king of who Christ will descend from. God chooses weak people to do his work. And you are great examples of that. You are weak, insufficient, and insignificant, and that makes you a perfect candidate to be used by God. It is encouraging to me to read time and time and time again in the scriptures, God using insufficient people to accomplish his sufficient plan. You see, but Esau was too proud for that. Esau became a man of great ability who viewed himself as self-sufficient in many ways, needing no one's help. And his pride and arrogance would ultimately lead him astray and lead to his downfall. You know, we tend to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. Almost all humans do. My wife recently read an article and shared it with me that 50% of white men believe that they, in an emergency situation that they could land a commercial aircraft. That's funny, right? It's absurd. There's no way you could do that if you haven't had training or whatever. But anyway, so I was arguing with her that I could, and <laughs> I have a friend who's a pastor that used to be an airline pilot, and when I was in the hospital, I was kind of bored, so I put him on speakerphone. I called him up, and I said, Jason, I need you to level with me. Is there a shot that I could land this plane? Like, you're in the tower. I got the headphones on. You're, you're with air traffic control. You're telling me what to do. I ride a motorcycle. That's got to help for something, right? And he's like, well, I want to say yes, there's a chance because I love you and you're my friend. But he's like, there's no chance <laughs> that you could do it. You're not making it out alive. And even though I had a professional tell me that, there's still a little piece of my brain that's like, I could do it. I could do it. I know I could. I've watched enough movies, right? <laughs> and those of you, who, you, you half the white men in the room, apparently, you guys still, even after all that, you still think you could do it. You're a perfect example of us thinking more highly of ourselves than we should. You see, our pride will always lead us into destruction. The, the, the book of Proverbs tells us that. Pride goes before a fall, um, most literally in, a, in an airplane. But, but even in all of life, pride will lead us to destruction. And it did for Esau. And pride leads us to accept the immediate instead of the inheritance. Because as, as people of God, as worshipers of Jesus, what we're called to do is not live for the immediate satisfaction and comfort. Not live for what's immediately in front of us, but live for what's beyond this life. The Bible calls us to lift our eyes higher than what's directly in front of us to what's in, in front of us in the eternal realm, that we call and beckon people to be in heaven with us forever, not just how, so we could you know, sing some cool songs and sing kumbaya together here on earth and be comfortable. You see, God had already chosen Jacob because he knew Esau's pride would lead him to disregard his inheritance and squander it away for what was immediately in front of him. And so let's look at God's choosing of Jacob and the doctrine of election. Now, the doctrine of election, let me preface this by saying it's, it's really troubling for a lot of people, um, but you can't pretend it doesn't exist in the Bible. The doctrine of election just simply means that God chooses people. God chooses people to be saved. If you have repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus, the Bible tells you, about you, that God chose you before the foundations of the world. And your whole life, your circumstances, the sharing of the gospel with you, all of those things were sovereignly orchestrated because God was pursuing you the whole time. And, and it feels like to us, like we did it. Like we found our way to God. Like we made a good decision, right? 
From our perspective, it feels like we did it. And then the more we read scripture and the more we learn about the God we serve, the more we see verses and, and chapters that indicate that God has a sovereign plan and he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. Passages like Romans 9 and Ephesians 1 and John 1, all of these things show us that God planned beforehand, chose beforehand. And here is a little bit of an uncomfortable situation where God chooses Jacob over Esau before anything had happened in their life. Um, God's answer to Isaac and Rebekah's prayer, in his answer, he tells them of his sovereign plan for their twin sons. The boys are wrestling in the womb. Sibling rivalry starts early, and, and God speaks in verse 23. Look at verse 22 and 23. The children struggled together within her, and she, Rebekah, said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two people from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. So there are two nations that historically, uh, biblically and extra biblically, that we know come from these two men, Jacob and Esau. These nations are Israel and Edom. Jacob's name, which means usurper, one who is always trying hard to win, uh, would be changed to Israel which means God wins. His, God changes his name to I win. God is telling Jacob, you need to learn. Get it through that thick skull of yours, Jacob, that God is victorious. And if you are ever victorious, it is only because the God you worship is. Jacob wasn't the strongest or the most competent. He was pretty sinful. He was deceptive. He was a trickster. But he would receive God's blessing only because of God's grace, not because he earned it. He was chosen before he had done any, anything good or bad. Esau, on the other hand, would not receive God's grace. He would receive condemnation. His name would be changed to Edom, which means red. I mean, even in the names this guy has, it's not going real well for him. So his name gets changed from Harry to Red. Okay, It's like, it's like guys that hang out at Coal Miner's Lounge, is who it sounds like. Um, and he gets the name Edom, which in Hebrew means red, for red stew that he ends up trading his birthright for, a bowl of soup. And ironically, the nation that would descend from him, his people, the, the nation of Edom, would inhabit a red, rocky land. I sort of looked like the, the red rocks of Colorado. That nation is prophesied against in the minor prophet of Obadiah, verses 8 and 9. God says to the people of Edom, generations after Esau, Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and the understanding out of Mount Esau? And your mighty men shall be dismayed, O team, and so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. So what we see historically is that Jacob and his descendants, Israel, received God's favor and grace, while Esau and his descendants, Edom, receive wrath and destruction. They literally just become a small footnote in history. And God told Rebekah that this would happen before they were born, before they had done anything good or bad. This is election. And when Paul sought to describe the doctrine of election to early Christians, in Romans chapter 9, he used this example to explain it. In Romans 9.10, he says, Not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue... Not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, and here he quotes the book of Malachi, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now some of us look at a verse like that and we're like, I don't like that. I thought God loved everybody. Don't God love everybody? Well, there's at least one guy that he doesn't love. And his name's Esau, Harry. Esau I hated? Really? God hates people? Does this make God cruel? Let me, let me submit to you this. God would be cruel if he loved evil people. He would cease to be just if he loved evil people. He saves evil people. He redeems evil people. But he does not love evil people. And so why, why does God elect and choose? Many of us would see the doctrine of election and say, well, why doesn't God choose everyone? I just tell you, you don't really want that. Adolf Hitler, Osama bin Laden. God is just. His purposes are good. 
and grand and beyond our comprehension. And Paul even anticipates that many of us will say, that's not fair. Because in the very next verse, Paul says, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. You see, history proves that God makes the right choice. We see that God made the right choice when we see how wicked Esau is. He's a horrible man who has horrible descendants that grow into a horrible nation. And so human actions validate God's sovereign choice, not the other way around. So many of us are quick to say, why doesn't God choose everyone? The real question should be, why does God choose anyone at all? Why would God choose to save any of us? Because all of us deserve to be damned for all eternity for our sins. None of us are righteous. No, not one. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. None of us are worthy. And so when we stand today, and we hopefully, I hope you have put your trust in Jesus and his death and resurrection. And if you do that, and you just... Think for a second, I am a Christian, I've been given eternal life and eternal inheritance, no one can touch it, no one can take it, that you would not say, why hasn't God chosen everyone, but you would say, why in the world would he choose someone like me? Why would he save someone like me? Why would Jesus die for me? And what that will lead you to is a deep, deep devotion and worship to him. We are a part of God's plan. He's not a part of ours. Our whole life is a part of God's plan, not how we fit God into our our life goals. When we start trying to fit God into our life goals, we begin to lower our eyes rather than lift them and look at very trivial things, temporary things. And we pridefully squander away our inheritance for tiny, comfortable things. Esau does this. For a bowl of stew. Verse 29. When, one day, once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore his name was called Edom. That means red. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Isaac had received his inheritance from Abraham, and now Jacob, instead of Esau, would receive it from Isaac. Jacob tricked him. Jacob lured him in. He's got a pot of Denny Moore on the stove, and you know, Esau had been out doing some Bear grill stuff. Evidently, he was to the point of literal starvation, but he lowered his eyes. He lowered his eyes to his own comfort, not what God's plan was, not what his, uh, his inheritance was supposed to be, but rather what was comfortable for him, what satisfied in the moment. You guys like, like hibachi food, Japanese steakhouse? Like One of my favorite pastimes in all of life is to sit there and have a man in a funny hat make me a volcano that shoots fire out of onions, and I eat fried rice. It's the best time of my life. It's one of the greatest gifts God has given me. But after hibachi, you can, I'll just let you all fill in the blank. You know how rough that can be, right? <laughs> but I don't care. I don't care because I'm just, I'm focused on, I'm in the moment, baby. Like, I'm just, get the volcano and the fried rice. And we do this spiritually all the time. We'll disregard what, what, what God's plan may be for our lives. We don't care the consequences of disobedience. We don't care the consequences of, of whether it pleases God or not. We only serve ourselves. I look at this story and I'm like, really? Esau, Harry. You gave it all away for one bowl of soup? All of your inheritance, all of your wealth. It almost feels unbelievable except when you realize what it's meant to point us to. The reality that every single day, men and women around us do the same thing. They squander away eternal grace freely given by God for temporary satisfactions, for temporary pleasure. You see, God's glorious doctrine of election, his sovereign choice, does not counter the glorious invitation to the whole world 
to come and be saved. In my finite Lincoln County brain, I cannot reconcile those two to help you sleep at night. But I can show you in his word that he proclaims both. God calls all people to come to him, repent, place their trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and they will be saved. None will be rejected. None will go to heaven, and and God will turn them away. Sorry you weren't picked. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so that's the invitation to the whole world. Yet every single day, people ignore that invitation for what's pleasurable for them in that day. In that moment. This morning, let me call you to this. Do not settle in your life for temporal pleasure or comfort. It's not worth it. And I think, no matter where you, whatever circumstances you find yourself in today, I think all of you know that to be true. Your greatest pleasure, that sinful vice that brings you happiness, the, the most comfortable you could be, you know deep down it's not worth it. It does not eternally satisfy like our God does. And maybe you're here and you're, you're thinking, wow, God chooses? Am I chosen? I think that question shows that the Spirit has drawn you. That, that you're here because people have loved you enough to invite you, to bring you, to welcome you into the family of God. And the, the responsibility that falls square in front of your eyes right now is to repent of your sins and be obedient to a sovereign God. Because he will not be a part of your plan, but he invites you to be a part of his.